Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you here this evening. My name is Frances Crook, and I'm Chief Executive of the Howard League for Penal Reform. Can you hear me okay? Because I'm not speaking directly in the microphone, which is what I was told to do. That's because I like to stand up and see you. I think I'm going to speak. I should stand up. Um, the first thing I must do before I forget, if there is a fire alarm, it's real, you have to go to the exits where it says the little running person is. Right, that's the only housekeeping thing I have to do. What about mobile phones? Oh, that's a good point. Good point. I'll confiscate them if they go off. <laughs> All right, so you can mute them or whatever. Uh, we, we don't mind if you want to tweet about it or if you other social media are obviously um, available. Um, please feel free, but yes, we, we don't like rigging tones. Um, I, I want to thank Clifford Chance for allowing us to use their fantastic facilities. Um, you'll have had a cup of tea and a, and a delicious biscuit and there's wine and canapes afterwards, which um, I hope you'll take the opportunity to stay for and mill about and network um, probably at about 7 o'clock. Um, I just want to welcome you to the, the lecture itself first, which is given in memory of Milo Cripps, Lord Palmore, who was a, a, a supporter of the Howard League for more than 20 years and was a very generous uh, donor to our work. So we, we set up the lectures uh, while he was still alive and he attended the first few, and I was really pleased about that. And um, we've kept the tradition going in his memory um, because of the, his generosity to the, to the Howard League um, over the years. Um, I'm extremely pleased that Alison Saunders, the relatively new Director of Public Prosecutions, um, is, is, uh, is going to speak this evening. But first we're going to, do, we're going to award some prizes um, and again, they're given in memory of a, of a long-term long -term, uh, benefactor and supporter of the, the work of the Howard League. And uh, John Sunley was a benefactor to many good causes. Uh, we were grateful for his support for us, but actually he was, a, he was a, a very generous man in his work. So I'm incredibly pleased uh, that Joan Tice's sister has been, uh, is going to present the prizes. We set up the awards for students who write really good and useful uh, master's um, dissertations. It's part, and I have to say there's a personal reason for this. My daughter did her master's and I thought this is really good, obviously because I, you know, it's my daughter. Um, but I saw some of her friends doing these essays and, and it was original work, it was exciting and actually nothing happened to them and I just thought it was a waste. So we set this up so that the best master's um, essays would be rewarded and we'll publish them. Uh, the, the top three get a nice prize, get an, an, a very generous prize um, a, awarded in memory of John Sunley. Um, and we have some really excellent academics who, who did the, the uh, award, chose the awards this year. Um, Professor Rachel Condry from Oxford, Dr. Elaine Genders from UCL, and Dr. Lizzie Seal at Sussex. Uh, we had this year an amazing um, selection of essays submitted, and it, they, they, the judges argued for hours. Um, and um, it, was, it was a really interesting process. So, Joan Tice, would you like to uh, give the awards, please? Well, good evening, everybody. I wish my brother was still with us on this earth to do the job himself, but um, I'll do my best to represent Brother John. So we're starting with uh, a good person. Janine Hunter, she's highly recommended.
a lot of uh, job <laughs> groups, so yeah. I guess. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> anyway. Well done. <laughs> noticed uh, they, they all had something in common. Uh, we did give a prize to a boy, <laughs> but he couldn't come this evening. So. Oh, I should have said that. Just, no, no, it's fine. Um, I mean, we're really pleased because the Howard League does a, a lot of work with academics, so it's really, really good to work with people who will probably go on to academic careers and I hope will work with us for many years afterwards. We'll always remember us and, and, and hopefully be grateful. <laughs> um, I'm Immensely pleased to be able to introduce um, Alison Saunders. Alison, we, we share an anniversary. I didn't tell you this when we, when we met. You started the CPS in 1986, and I started at the Howard League in 1986. Uh, so we've both been um, shared our, a, a sort of similar career trajectory in a way. Um, and I think it's really you, you've uh, been involved in issues of intense public concern at the moment, the serious and organised crime, and of course the child victims as well. Uh, so I know you're going to talk about public interest, and I'm, I'm very, very pleased to welcome you here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, and I'm sure, Francis, you were 10 as well, like Absolutely. I was when we joined in 1986, so yeah. just thought I'd better make that one clear. Um, thank you very much um, for inviting me this um, evening to give this talk. Um, I'm really honoured to be able to um, deliver your annual lecture and hope very much that I live up to expectations. And I've managed to leave enough time, I hope, at the end um, for a question and answer session. So if you have any burning questions, um, so long as they're nice ones, of course, then please do ask at the end um, when I've finished. Um, and hopefully we can engage in a useful debate. Um, for me, the Howard League does very important work in examining and contributing to the debate on how the criminal justice system work, works, and particularly your work around children and young people. Um, that has a special resonance for us as prosecutors, as we need to make sure that those come in, that come into contact with the criminal justice system very early in their lives, as defendants, victims or witnesses, are supported and come out of it with an outcome um, that is positive. Um, hard to do in the criminal justice system and that's why the work is so important about trying to actually prevent people getting into the criminal justice system at all and I will return to that later. Um, I've been lucky enough as Francis said to work for the CPS for a number of years and worked in a range of roles and for me it has been an incredibly positive career um, and I've been very um, grateful to be able to work for a service and in a job that has brought me great satisfaction. Um, knowing that the work that I do helps protect the public and also supports one of the key tenets of an open and democratic civil society, that's the right to a fair trial, is really important to me and to the prosecutors who I work with. And it's easy for others to forget sometimes that that is important to us as it is to everybody else, that there is a fair trial and that we play our part in making sure that there is a fair trial. Um, prosecution isn't always an easy role, um, I wish that it were, um, and I know all too well that some of the recent decisions that we have made um, prompt some public debate, quite rightly so. Um, in recent years, we have become far more transparent and open. We explain our decisions now in a way that we never used to, certainly when I um, started in 1986. We will barely explain our decisions to police officers, let alone explain it to the general public or to society as a whole. So we've vastly improved the amount and the quality of information that we give to the public in order to better explain how we have arrived at our decisions. And that's extremely important. If we want the public to have confidence in us as prosecutors and as a service, we need to be open, transparent and accountable for our decisions. How can you be accountable for your decisions if people don't know how you have reached them? 
They may not agree with those decisions, but if they can see that there has been a fair and consistent decision-making process, that makes it better. But the fact remains that some of the decisions that we make are complex and occasionally controversial. So tonight I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we make our decisions and as an illustration of the complexity, um, talk about our decisions, particularly in child sex abuse cases and also um, later on talk a little bit about how we explain our decisions and how we achieve that transparency that I think is so important. Um, but first let me um, spend a little time outlining my role as head of the Crown Prosecution <coughs> Service. As a director of public prosecutions, I have to take decisions, as do the rest of my prosecutors, that are free of political interference, and importantly, not just do that, but be seen to do that. Each case should be decided upon its merits and on its merits alone. Um, but there's also a need for me to be accountable um, to the public through Parliament, and that's why we are superintended by the Attorney General. That's an important word for us superintendents. It's not defined in the statute, the Prosecution of Offences Act, which sets us up and sets out that relationship. Um, and it is not the same as a normal relationship between a public official and their minister. It is a very different relationship. The Attorney General accounts to Parliament for the actions of the CPS, but he is not responsible for individual casework decisions, except in a very limited range of circumstances, <coughs> such as unduly lenient sentences, where it is his decision-making. But the Attorney also plays an important role in helping to guard the CPS from political interference. The management of the casework and the decisions of the prosecutors who work for the CPS are my ultimate responsibility for the DPP. And just to give you an, an illustration of the range of casework that we might do with over a year, we prosecute in about 800,000 cases over the course of any one year. And that can range from anything through from um, traffic type offences through to um, murder, homicide at the other end, terrorist offences, organised crime. Um, so a vast range of offences across that 800,000 cases. This obviously gives me a very clear incentive to make sure that those decisions are clearly supportable and explainable wherever possible. And there are tools that help me and all prosecutors to do this. For example, our legal guidance on particular offences, which are published on our website for everyone to see. But the key decision-making tool which all prosecutors use in every single case is the Code for Crown Prosecutors. The publication of the Code is one of my duties as DPP that is set out in the Prosecution of Offences Act 1985, which set up the CPS and also set up our relationship with the Attorney General. The Code, if you haven't seen it, and bear with me, because this is an important document and is at the bottom of every single case that we prosecute, sets out two stages that prosecutors must go through when deciding whether or not to prosecute any case. The first stage is the consideration of the evidence. Um, if the case does not pass the evidential test, it will not go ahead no matter how important, sensitive or complex that case is. If it doesn't pass the evidential stage, that is an end of the matter and Crown prosecutors will terminate the prosecution or not um, bring it in the first place. However, if it does pass the evidential sta stage, there is another test that Crown prosecutors must go on to consider, and that's to decide if a prosecution is needed in the public interest. Dealing firstly just with that evidential stage to explain a little bit more about what it is about, prosecutors must be satisfied that there is enough evidence to provide a realistic prospect of conviction against each defendant on each charge. Yes. And when deciding whether or not there is enough evidence to prosecute, prosecutors will consider whether the evidence can be used or is reliable and can be used in court. They must also consider what defence might, the defence case might possibly be and how that is likely to affect a prosecution case. It's an objective test and absolutely rightly so. A realistic prospect of conviction means that a jury or a bench of magistrates or a judge hearing the case alone properly directed in accordance with the law is more likely than not to convict the defendant of the charged alleged. Importantly, and sometimes this is overlooked, this test is a separate one from the, and a very different one from the test that criminal courts themselves apply. A court should only convict if satisfied to the extent that it is sure of a defendant's guilt. 
And this is why from time to time in the wake of an acquittal, it is sometimes asked, why did the prosecution decide to go ahead with the case? In these instances, the prosecution has established that there is a realistic prospect of conviction, but the bench or jury has decided that it has not been proved beyond reasonable doubt. There's been some examples recently of um, some cases involving well-known people where this has been acutely um, highlighted in the press and debated. In those cases, our cases were strong enough to be put to the court, and of course we accept the judge or the jury's decision. But it must be remembered that the roles of the CPS and the jury are completely different. And so it is entirely legitimate for them to come to different conclusions, but entirely possible for it to have been right to bring a case for the, to court, but right for the jury to acquit. Additional protections are that if a judge feels that a prosecution case should not be put to a jury, he or she can direct an acquittal. Last year, about 0.7% of CPS prosecutions led to a judge-directed acquittal in such circumstances, so an extremely small percentage. And it is not an acquittal, as some commentators have suggested in recent times, a crisis justifying a review of the prosecution service. It is justice working as it should do. Um, just a little bit of audience participation at this point, um, which you may not have been warned about. But just let me um, ask you some questions before you get in and ask me anything. Um, on a sort of straw poll, just a show of hands, um, I'd like to sort of just take you through what you think a good um, percentage or conviction rate should be. So does anyone think that the prosecution service should be obtaining convictions in 90, over 90% of cases? Hands up if you do. No. Over 80%? Okay, a few more. 70%? Um, oh, interesting. Any below 70%? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I think some people voted twice. <laughs> um, that's really interesting because some of the publicity that you'll have seen recently is around we've had an acquittal, therefore it's a crisis, the case should never have been brought. And there seems to be a misunderstanding of the tests that we bring and the tests that the court bring. And certainly I would not want to be um, in charge of a prosecution service where we are taking cases to court and getting over 90% or 95% or whatever um, convictions because I think we could rightly be accused then of being risk averse, only taking those cases that we thought and not actually um, serving the public that we serve um, and it is justice as we see it in our country actually taking effect that the jury and the court have a role to play in deciding guilt or not. Um, just to answer the question that may come later, our conviction rate is around 85%, um, so it's a lot higher than many of you think it should be, so that's an interesting thing for me to take away and reflect on. Um, after we've looked at the evidential test, we then go on to look at the public interest test. And it's never been the case, and nor should it, that just because the evidential test is satisfied, that a prosecution automatically follows. And again, that is sometimes a misconception that there is in, um, in the public. So in every case, we go on to consider whether a prosecution is um, required in a public interest. And the code sets out the sort of factors, and it's not an exhaustive list, but it sets out the sort of factors that prosecutors should take into account. So some of it will be, um, can we actually sort of deal with the case by way of an out-of-court disposal? Is that going to be a better way of dealing with it than taking the case through the court? And the other factors that we'll, um, we'll look at is something like the seriousness of the offence, the culpability of the suspect and the level of culpability. And clearly the more serious the offence or the greater the culpability, the more likely it is that a prosecution will follow. Um, the circumstances of the victim are also highly relevant to our decision making. So again, the greater the vulnerability of the victim, the more likely that a prosecution is required. And this is particularly so when a victim or um, a suspect is in a position of trust or authority um, and there is that relationship between the victim and suspect. But prosecutors will also take into account the views expressed by the victim about the impact that the offence has had, or in appropriate cases, the views of the victim's family. But the circumstances of the defendant are also highly relevant to our decision-making process. 
The criminal justice system we know treats children and young people differently from adults, and significant weight must be attached to the age of the suspect if they are a child or a young person under 18. So for prosecutors, the best interests and the welfare of the child must be considered when considering whether a prosecution is likely to have an adverse impact on their future prospects that could be seen to be disproportionate to the seriousness of the offending. As a starting point, the younger the suspect, the less likely it is that a prosecution is required. That said, of course, other factors, including the seriousness of the offending, the child's previous offending history, may mean that a public uh, may mean that a prosecution would be in the public interest. So it's not a clear tick box, you know, if you get two factors on this side, that means we will prosecute or we won't. It's a balancing act, but these are all factors that prosecutors should be taking into account. So for those aged from between 10 and 17 who are accused of being involved in criminal procedure, criminal behaviour, sorry, there is, of course, a whole youth justice system geared to diverting these individuals from crime as early as possible. Um, we have youth specialist prosecutors in all of our 13 areas who deal with these cases. They've all been specially trained and have at their disposal clear guidance, which is on our website if you haven't looked at it, um, that ensures that we play our part in trying to turn around the lives of those who find themselves in this position so that we can assist them and we can um, help achieve a better outcome. So a decision to prosecute a youth must only be taken after full review of the case and consideration of the circumstances and general, general character of the individual concerned. And this will include information about the individual's home circumstances and their background. And we get that, this from sources such as the police, youth offending services, the local authority and or children's services in the locality. It is essential that all of the public interest matters which give rise to the decision are identified, considered and balanced in order to make an informed and a correct decision. Um, moving back to sort of general types of cases where successful prosecutions are notoriously hard to obtain, um, there, even though the police officer in the, case, in the case and the Crown prosecutor may believe that the complainant is truthful and reliable, the, there are types of cases that are notoriously difficult to obtain convictions in. To give an example, so-called, um, and I hate this phrase, but I will use it because you'll understand what it is, but date rape cases are examples. If the Crown prosecutor were to apply a purely predictive approach based on past experience of similar cases, what um, it has been called by the Court of Appeal the bookmaker's approach, um, the prosecutor might well feel unable to conclude that a jury was more likely than not to convict a defendant. Um, similar considerations have arisen historically in cases of child sex abuse, where the behaviour of victims has been seen as undermining their credibility as witnesses, and therefore affected the prosecutor's judgment of a realistic prospect of conviction. Now, I'm very pleased to say, we look at this issue very differently. In the merits-based approach, the question of whether the evidential test was satisfied does not depend on guesswork about whether a jury is likely to convict, because we know they never have in the past 10 cases that we've brought. It doesn't depend on that sort of statistical guesswork. Instead, the prosecutor imagines him or herself to be the fact finder and asks whether on balance the evidence was sufficient to merit a conviction, taking into account what was known about the defence case. So this approach means that when assessing credibility, the focus is on the allegation rather than shifting away, rather than looking at the credibility of the victim. So we have shifted away from just looking at factors which we might say undermine the credibility of the victim to looking at the overall allegation, including an assessment of the defendant's credibility. And the aim there is to ensure that victims are listened to, treated fairly, and have the opportunity to obtain justice. In addition, prosecutors should proceed on the basis of a notional jury which is wholly unaffected by miss. A prosecutor must further assume that the jury will be properly directed in accordance with the law by the judge and that those directions will be followed. The new CPS guidance on child sexual abuse um, emphasised the need to recognise and challenge commonly held myths and stereotypes about the nature of sexual abuse and the way that real victims behave. It also details the impact of sexual violence on victims and the need to ensure that they are dealt with in a way that avoids further victimisation. 
Myths arise from and reinforce prejudices and stereotypes which are present in all of our communities. And that's why it is so important for prosecutors and police to ensure that they examine evidence in a way which is free from prejudice and when cases are presented in court that we do so in a way which explains perhaps the myths and stereotypes to juries that must then decide on the evidence before them. In relation to child sexual abuse cases, it's evident from some recent um, examples that victims of child sexual exploitation can sometimes have what are described as chaotic lives. In some instances, their evidence seems to have been confused. Um, their loyalty seemed to be allied to their exploiters. And rather than taking it as a sign that they and their evidence is unreliable, prosecutors should now help to juries to understand that these may be the effects of years of sexual exploitation and that they may result in victims having and living chaotic lives. And of course, it is part of that chaotic lives that makes them the victims in the first place. So it is absolutely wrong for us to re-victimise them again. Understanding this is crucial when we are confronted by other types of offending. So, for example, um, this can be illustrated by the expression child prostitute. Um, that implies that a child's probably taken a career choice at some point and has chosen to be a child prostitute. Um, the truth is more likely to be that they were exploited and forced into criminality for another's gain. And we must ensure that we recognise this as prosecutors and we recognise them as a victim rather than an offender to be prosecuted. Another troubling example, which um, is something that has been taxing us recently, is um, where a girl is trafficked into the UK for prostitution and then assists in the trafficking of other girls, quite possibly from the same country and with the same vulnerabilities as herself. Again, clearly, offending of this nature demands close consideration by prosecutors, but it would be wrong to prosecute in these types of circumstances where actually the offender, if you want to call them that, has been a victim themselves, and that is why they are in that situation. So our guidance to prosecutors is becoming much more specific about highlighting these types of issues to ensure that we do properly act in the public interest and we do consider the evidence that we have before us and to look at it in the right way. As well as the new approach advocated by the Child Sexual Abuse Guidance, um, our aim has been to achieve consistent and high standards in all the cases that we prosecute and all cases that are regarded by prosecutors. Um, child sex abuse cases, for example, must now be dealt with by specialist prosecutors. We have specialist rape and serious sexual assault units which handle these cases. And the prosecutors undertake um, specific training working with the police to build effective cases and to learn how to support victims. So we provide early investigative advice to police to make sure that we build effective cases and we also work alongside specialist support services such as sexual assault referral centres and independent sexual advisors. And this specialisation has already contributed to an import improvement in the performance of our prosecutors and also make sure that we have in sight things such as third party material and medical notes which may be sought at an early stage. And of course, we have already been doing that in relation to youth cases where we have specialist prosecutors who have gone through training and only once they have been accredited can they then be involved in um, cases involving youth. So we've had training on the prosecution of sexual child sexual offences, which has been delivered this year. That's involved face-to-face -face training for specialist lawyers, um, dealing with lessons learnt from um, the Jimmy Savile case and also in-house training for all prosecutors to introduce our new child sexual abuse guidance, which were widely consulted on. Of course, I've talked a lot about victims um, in, in the previous um, part of this speech, but there is also a need for us to consider the best way of dealing with what might be called the perpetrators of these offences. So successful prosecution is key to both punish the individual and send a clear signal that crimes will not be tolerated. But by the time we reach a prosecution, it's really too late. The offence has already been committed and the victim has suffered. So we should also consider, I think, we in the more general, not just prosecutors, what factors are behind offending why has it happened? What can we do to prevent it from happening in the first place? My ultimate aim would be to do myself out of a job and not have to prosecute any crimes. 
I'm not sure that in my next four years I'm likely to see that, but we can at least move some way towards it. But certainly organisations like the Howard League are hugely instrumental in assisting us as society understand why crimes might happen, what we can do to prevent, and how we can best rehabilitate offenders. So I'm very pleased to have been able to come here today and to support the Howard League and also to work with you in the future. I said I would also explain, um, just in the last five or ten minutes um, before I do take questions, how we explain our decisions, because when I started um, in the CPS in 1986, as that young 10-year-old, of course, um, we didn't really talk very much about how we explained our decisions. We talked to ourselves. We might explain to police officers, possibly, not really very much, um, but we didn't really talk about very much. We have come a long way, I think, since then in making our service far more public-facing. So we've taken a far more open um, approach to policy making, which is important, and we consult with interest groups and experts to help develop guidance for our prosecutors. So we not only do that with experts um, who we get in to help us draft the um, guidance in the first place, but we also put our policies out for public consultation. And if you looked at our social media guidance, for example, that was a very recent example of um, that having gone out for consultation. Our policy on assisted suicide had, not surprisingly, perhaps the most um, responses that we've ever had in relation to a consultation. And that really helps to inform us about exactly how the guidance should be drafted and the most effective way of dealing with these cases. We also engage with the media to help the public better understand our work. And we have recently reformed the way that we communicate with victims. So each area across the CPS now has dedicated victim liaison units who are specifically trained to communicate in a way that doesn't just use legalese, which we're often accused of. And I've certainly seen it and wondered myself, actually, how anyone else would understand the letter, because I couldn't. Um, and also, it's really important that we communicate in a way where we show some empathy and we explain our decisions in clear and plain language. That's what the victim liaison units do. And we have also recently, over the last year, introduced the victim's right to review policy. And this provides victims with a clear opportunity to ask us to look at a decision not to start or to stop a prosecution. In the first 10 months of the scheme, we made, um, it was um, 114 qualifying decisions, roughly. So decisions that fall within the scheme that victims could, if they wanted to, ask us to review again. Um, of that, 162 um, decisions um, which is equated, equates to 0.14% were overturned. So only a very small proportion of decisions needed to be changed. But I think this is a really important development because it shows as an organisation we are prepared to listen if people think we have our decisions um, wrong, if we've made the wrong decision. And also we will revisit them and overturn them if indeed we have got them wrong, which I think is a sign of a mature organisation that is prepared to learn. We are now tracking those cases to see what happens to them as we take them through the courts, and so far the success rate in those cases where we have reinstituted the, the prosecution has been good. Again, all of these measures are vital because we prosecute on behalf of the public. Um, we don't do it for fun. We act on behalf of you and the rest of the public, and therefore it is important that we are seen and must act in relation to the public interest. This means we have a duty to be open and accountable to the public, explaining our decisions and helping the public to understand our approach. I hope um, that what I have talked about tonight contributes a little bit towards explaining how we make our decisions and our approach. I hope it explains the tests that we do and how we take our role very seriously. We are completely jealous about our independence um, and get quite vociferous if it is challenged at any point by anyone, and quite rightly so. We are independent, we act on behalf of the public, and it is important that everybody sees what we do and how we do it. So thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to um, make this speech tonight, um, and I think I'm probably just about on time and ready to answer any questions. Thank you very much. That was really interesting, and you touched on such important issues, both looking at process 
um, because how things are done matters, um, and in what sort of atmosphere they're done, but also some really important and contentious issues of, of public concern. I think I, I sat on a jury in a, in a, oh. a sexual offences case, which I can't tell you about, except that the, uh, it was a rape case, and um, the decision was 11-1. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they all went to the pub without me. <laughs> Kept them there all day. Um, right. <laughs> um, questions and, and uh, or comments? We we do have microphones. We do have microphones. Um, if you don't ask, I will pick on someone. Uh, yes. In the middle. Oh, thank you. Say, say your name and Thank you. Uh, Paul Sales, would you care to comment about the age of criminal responsibility, which many people feel to be much too low? Um, I'm obviously not going to comment on the legislation because of the position I hold. It's a matter for the government if they want to change the law. You can tell I've been used to saying this now, haven't you, after, after a year in this position. Um, <laughs> I think it's really important, I mean I'm not going to comment on whether it should be lower or higher, but I do think it is really important that prosecutors have in their sort of consideration when they're looking at cases the age of the offender. Um, and as I've said, the younger the offender, the more reluctant we should be to take them through the criminal process. Um, and in exceptional cases where it's really serious, those are the sorts of cases where there is no alternative that we should be. But we should be working with others to really search out are there alternatives what can we do that is going to be beneficial both to the victim and to the offender um, to take to do is that a good politician's answer <laughs> and the answer to your question Paul is yes <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lady in front here front her. yes yes thank you Hi, uh, my name's Deb Borg and I'm a probation officer and I also qualified in, for an LSE in 1986. So <laughs> it's a popular year. <laughs> popular year. Um, and I've been working as a probation officer since that time in London. And uh, currently we're very concerned at what's happening to our service. Um, for those, I think quite a few people know, but um, all the trusts were abolished at the end of May. And um, the service was split and now 70% um, is going to be put out for um, private companies to bid for, and we're, we're very concerned about that. And I think generally the, um, the probation service has not been very good perhaps at describing the work we do and at being transparent. Mm. And so my question would be, how can we make our work more transparent to the public in the hope that um, people will realize it's absolutely essential that the probation service is kept as a public sector profession and not sold off. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think it's really important because I think it comes into, A, people understanding what you do, as you say, but having the confidence to, do, to rely on your service. Um, and, I mean, the way in which we have done it, um, if it helps at all to understand what we've done, is really around making... <coughs> We took a positive decision to get out and to deal with the media rather than just to sit in our offices, do our job and not talk about it. So it has been a conscious decision which has not um, necessarily gone down well with some members of the service over the past. Um, and there are still some people in the service that think that we are prosecutors, we shouldn't be talking to the media at all. I mean, I think it's really important because if we don't, how can anyone have confidence in the decisions that we make behind closed doors? Um, so we do lots of things. It's not always easy to get good news out there, um, but equally when there is criticism, I think it's really important to go out and defend the service if it's appropriate um, and to explain what we do and how we do it. So I don't think there's any one simple answer apart from just get out there and do it, which sounds very simple, doesn't it? Um. Right, now this is what always happens. A few people ask it, so I'm going to take two or three at a time. Is that, is that okay? Mm -hmm. uh, a gentleman here, and somebody at the back. Ah, oh, yes. So, one, two, three. Um, our vision is a little bit of prosecutors as being people who are trying to make a case for, uh, in an adversarial way but you paint a picture of 
uh, prosecutors as being more inquisitorial. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they know something that perhaps is on the defense side, they would think about this. And they don't go into uh, trials saying to themselves, now I've got to make this, this case regardless. Uh, and it's my job to present, you might say, the po positive ideas about, about uh, uh, guilt and so mm -hmm. forth. But you make it sound as though um, that r really prosecutors are, are, are more sensitive about this. And if there is inf defense information that they, that they know about, they would, sh they would share this. So I'd be interested in your mm. comments about this. Shall I take, uh, do you want a pen and paper? Um, <laughs> it's your pen, thank you. Um, so that's one, and there's at the back, yes, there, thank you. Hello, Alison. Um, thanks for your interesting uh, talk. My name's Ian Langley. I'm the uh, uh, Secretary of the Association of Youth Defending Team Managers. I was interested um, in what you were saying about the victim review policy. Uh, I may have got this wrong, this may be sheerly down to ignorance, but does that policy apply to decisions made by the police? Um, because if it doesn't, and I understand it doesn't, I think there's a real loophole there and something I've actually had personal experience of. Yeah. Um. And finally, for this, this batch, we'll, I'll do another batch. We've got 15 minutes. It's first, lots, lots mm. of different questions. Thank you. Good evening, Roger Hovell. I'm a Justice of the Peace. Uh, what is your perceived opinion of the threat to the magistracy. Okay, um, lots of varied questions. Um, inquisitorial, I hope I didn't just make it sound as though we do that, we do do that. Um, it's really important, I think, for prosecutors to understand what the defence case is going to be and anticipate what the defence case is going to be. Um, I don't think you can be a good prosecutor unless you do that because sometimes it is around making sure that you fill in the gaps in the prosecution. Sometimes it will be saying, actually, we've got this piece of information. We know it undermines our case. We're never going to be um, prosecuting this case because we shouldn't be. Um, and we do still discontinue many cases because um, we don't think we have sufficient evidence and therefore the case shouldn't go to court. Um, and we are very, um, we do look at cases that fail to see why did we take that case to court? Was it one that we shouldn't have done in the first place? What lessons can we learn from it? Um, but it is very important that we act in that inquisitorial way. And of course, we must look at all the information, whether we're using it or not, to see whether it undermines or assists um, the defence. And if it does, then we disclose that. And some of it we can disclose and deal with. Some of it will be such that we should be stopping the case. So we are very much more um, balanced, I think, than quite often is, is the perception. So, um, In relation to VRR, you're absolutely right. It only applies at the moment to prosecutors. It doesn't apply to police charging decisions, of which there are still quite a lot. Um, I think that is going to have to change because the victims, EU Victims Directive, if it still applies next year, um, will come into force and I think that will in itself force the police to um, look at it and I do know that police colleagues are looking at how they are going to deal with this um, because it seems slightly odd that just because a decision is made by us that you can review it but if it's made by the police you can't. Um, in relation to the magistracy, um, a really good question. Um, <coughs> For my own view, I think the magistracy will continue, um, not least because we're about to roll out transforming summary justice, um, which I think rather confirms the importance of the magistrate's court and the need to make it as effective as we possibly can. Um, and that includes lay magistrates as well as um, professional magistrates. So um, my own view is I think the magistracy will continue. It's a really important role. <coughs> Thank you. Right. Uh, lady at the back, gentleman at the back, <laughs> and Martin. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Catherine Baxi, freelance journalist. Um, would you be in favour of criminalising, uh, sorry, televising criminal trials? And if, if so, would it affect, how would it affect the cases that you prosecuted and the advocates you instructed? Hello, my name's Tom. I guess I'm just a student, really. Um, but what you touched briefly on the, um, the mental health of victims, 
But another big issue, I think, is, is the mental health of offenders. Mm -hmm. And I realize that you can't comment on you know, parliamentary legislation, but it hasn't exactly been um, on the mark in that regard. So I'm wondering about how sensitive, how sensitive you are to the, you know, the, the mental health of offenders. Yeah. Wait for your microphone. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> Can't control previous directions. Thank you. You mentioned out of court disposals, and one of the reasons why the CPS was set up in 1986 was to uh, filter out some of the cases which needn't go to court. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons for not prosecuting may be making reparation. Would you like to say more about referring cases to a restorative justice process mm -hmm. uh, instead of prosecuting? Mm -hmm. Because in a number of countries, prosecutors are the main source of referrals to restorative justice. Yeah. Okay, um, televising trials. Um, we want to be as open and transparent as possible. Hopefully that's clear from some of the work that we're already doing about explaining our decisions. Um, if the decision is to televise trials, and obviously there's a pilot going on at the moment with appeals, which is very different, um, then I think there are a number of issues that will need to be considered. Um, I certainly know of um, one appeal case already, and I mean it's a, a pilot that has been done, I think so far has been pretty well received. Um, I don't know how many people are watching it, but the, the appeals are going out and they're being televised. We, it's got a slight time delay, um, which is good, um, but even then we have already had one case with, um, where a victim's name was televised, which it shouldn't have been, which caused quite a lot of distress to the victim and breached all the anonymity provisions. So there are some real issues there about how we cope with that. I don't think it's impossible, but there's issues about how we cope with it. Um, of course, the Lord Chief Justice has said he's looking again, because it's ultimately, I think, his decision um, and his support is vital, but he's looking at it again in the, view, in the light of the Pistorius trial, um, where I think we saw some behaviours there, which I wouldn't expect my prosecutors necessarily to exhibit, <laughs> if I put it that way. Um, would it impact on um, my choice of counsel? I would hope not. Um, if we think that they're good enough to prosecute now, they should be good enough to prosecute in the full glare of TV. And I wouldn't be picking prosecutors just because they were TV friendly. Um, so um, it would absolutely not impact on the choice. Um, I do think there are real issues about how we deal with victims and witnesses and defence witnesses who are giving evidence. Again, that can be dealt with if they don't want to be televised. There have to be some ground rules about that but there's no reason why we have, shouldn't have more open access to justice um, if, you know, if we can um, get around those things which are not impossible. Um, mental health offenders, um, I wouldn't say I'm just a student, I'm just a prosecutor. Um, I think it's really important. Um, so um, I think mental health is a real issue across the board, whether it's with victims or offenders. Um, part of the issue there is being able to identify that there are mental health issues and then to have the services in place to deal. Um, and we have some, still have some specialist courts which are very good at picking up these issues um, and dealing with them. Sometimes uh, my concern is around sort of perhaps mental health issues that are not so obvious um, where we really need to be able to identify that there are issues there which will impact on our decision making but if we don't know it we won't be able to factor that in but will also impact on the way in which the court behaves and the, the types of um, solutions that the court might be looking at. So I think it's a big issue and I'm not sure it's one that we've quite got right in this, well, I don't think we've got it right across the system yet. Um, out-of-court disposals, um, there is an out-of-court disposal review going on at the moment. I think we've got reviews into pretty much everything possibly. Um, but it's looking at um, piloting very shortly a two-tier system around out-of-court disposals. I do think prosecutors have a major role to play in that because, as our guidance says, not everything should go before the court just because we think we have enough evidence. Um, and it's in the public interest, it may well be in the public interest for there to be an out-of-court disposal, whether that includes restorative justice or it's a simple straightforward caution. Um, the, uh, the conditional cautions that prosecutors have been able to uh, um, um, impose, well we don't impose it because victims and defendants have to agree to it, I think it has been one of those issues that we perhaps again haven't made as much of 
possibly because the services that we might need aren't always there. So things like if you want to refer somebody because you need some sort of anger management or it's an alcohol or drugs issue where you might have a course, it's making sure that those services are there to be able to help. Um, the offender who's subject to the conditional caution. The two-tier approach is very much looking at um, simple cautions and having sort of conditional cautions, um, and prosecutors will be playing a role in that, and I think it's very important because I don't think we should be putting everybody through the courts. There are alternative ways which might be far more beneficial in preventing people going into the system and then just churning around. I'll take one more group. <laughs> one more group. Um, Yes, in the middle there, Babs. One more. All right, I'll take two more groups, but nobody else has put their hand up. So, a uh, gentleman there, yellow T-shirt, and a gentleman there next door. So that's one, two, three, and then the next lot um, I'll ask as well. My name is Sidney Norris. I used to work in the Home Office. Uh, I'd, I'd first just like to say how impressive and reassuring I found your account of how the Crown Prosecution Service has developed. Thank you. My question relates to those cases where you have to consider prosecuting people who have been engaged in trafficking and in sexual or other ex exploitation of people brought in from abroad. Is the immigration status of victims and witnesses uh, and their risk of being deported or fear of being deported a prob problem in these cases. Gentleman there. In view of the changes um, that are happening to criminal legal aid, do you foresee a crisis of representation? And how might that affect your decision making? You're getting very different sorts of questions. I know. I did warn it's, you. It's, it's a bit like appearing in front of the Home Affairs Select Committee. <laughs> <laughs> Which and was... uh, such an expert audience, yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Emmanuel Faraday. I'm a pedagogue and a youth justice professional. Um, what, are your, um, what is your comment or your opinion on the CPS being described as acting like Judge Dredd in its response to sentencing of people involved in the riot-related offences from 2011? Okay, um, taking them in order, although I'm tempted to deal with the last one first, because um, I'd have a very short answer to that one. Um, trafficking immigration status, um, it plays no role in the decision making, um, and nor should it, um, because I think we look at the evidence in the case and we look at whether or not there is sufficient evidence there. Trafficking, I think, is a really difficult for prosecutors um, and investigators, actually, um, to identify where victims have been trafficked. Um, and one of the issues that we've been really struggling with at the moment is how do we identify sometimes when people are presented as offenders to understand that actually they may be trafficked and therefore they are victims and should not be prosecuted. So for me that's far more of an issue almost than their immigration status. Um, the, the only issue around the immigration status is once we have decided to prosecute, if it's a witness, um, the issue about whether or not they're going to be deported and therefore whether they're going to be available for evidence. But we have, um, we have quite li good lines of communication to um, the Home Office um, and people that we can talk to about that. But the real issue for me at the moment is identifying those victims that have been trafficked who are presented as offenders. And often that's because they don't reveal that they are, um, and I suppose it comes back to your immigration point, but they don't reveal that they are in fact victims because they are worried about their immigration status and they don't want to be at risk of being deported and sent home. Um, and that's where the third sector often come in because we've had lots which have ended up in prison and then been identified as victims. Um, so it's around making sure we deal with that quickly at the beginning. Um, criminal legal aid, um, I mean the crisis has been averted, um, there, is, um, there are discussions ongoing. We've made our position very plain about that. We are concerned to make sure that there, are, there is still a fair trial, that people have access to justice. Um, you know, selfishly, if people are represented well in court, it makes our role much easier. It makes us have confidence in the system as well and the public. So um, we have made it very clear that we think that um, we need to make sure there is provision for fair trials to take place. 
Um, Judge Dredd, we are absolutely not Judge Dredd. Um, I live through, I take this quite personally, I lived through the riots and was Chief Crown Prosecutor for London at the time of the riots and therefore was um, responsible for many of the charging decisions and even if I'd been DPP I would have been responsible. Um, many of the cases and some of the cases that appeared in the press today which were highlighted as possible ones which have been um, sort of overcharged, over-sentenced, had been looked at carefully by us. They had gone through on appeal as well to the Court of Appeal, who had again confirmed both um, the conviction and the sentence. Um, and it's very easy in the cold light of day to sort of forget actually the sort of what the courts took into account, which was the aggravating factors at that time about sort of you know, mass disorder. Um, and the fact that there was um, conduct taking place was no excuse for people to go out and just help themselves to things or to take part in conduct that they shouldn't have been. So, but we were very careful that we still applied the code. Um, there were cases that we discontinued, cases that we didn't continue with. Um, so I'm very clear that we prosecuted those cases properly and we certainly didn't act as Judge Dredd. That's a longer answer than the one I was initially attempted to give. <laughs> and we're grateful. I'll take one last group. Former member of staff at the back, there. Put your hand up. Your pupil, barrister there. Pupil, or are you? Uh, anyway. My name's Jennifer Kay. Um, I just wondered, once the decision has been taken to prosecute, if you think that the CPS currently have the resources to maintain public confidence once that prosecution reaches the courtroom, my experience is of delay, paucity of evidence, and cases incorrectly charged. And I was wondering how you're going to address that. Thank you. One, two, three. So that's four, and that's it. One. Hello. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Chris. Um, I wanted to pick up, and again, and maybe a slightly different angle about um, child um, children that are trafficked to this country and um, as a, a, a victims of. Um, as you mentioned in your um, speech about them being um, child prostitutes, but also it resonates with um, children, you know, shipped over to work in cannabis factories and so on, particularly Vietnamese children. Um, and where your guidance has changed on um, recognising that they're victims and that, what of those that have already been prosecuted before, before the mm -hmm. guidance and what relationships do you need with organisations that exist or are working with them to make sure that they have justice retrospectively. Yeah. Thank you. Lady at the front, and um, there was one more, wasn't there? Um, uh, lady at the back, you've got your mic. Uh, Jackie Tapley, uh, I work at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, and my question is, given the uh, difficulty that the police have in recognising vulnerable and intimidated victims and witnesses, and then the problems that the CP CPS have with regards to timely applications for special measures, uh, whether perhaps special measures shouldn't be so special at all, and whether they should be available to all victims and wit uh, witnesses? Question. Lady in pink. Um, Valerie Stone, I've worked in prisons for quite a long time. Um, you made several references to the need to make sure that there are appropriate services for people who come, who um, potential offenders come with mental health or other significant problems. Um, given your independent status, is there any contribution you, you can make to this, or are you, can you only say we wish there were? Okay. Um, sorry, I've just turn the thing off. Um, confidence um, in decision making post um, charging. Um, I'm not going to stand here and say I wouldn't welcome far more resources. Um, if somebody would like to give me far more resources that would be very welcome. Um, but we have worked very hard on refocusing the service. So we've moved our resources around, we've shut offices, we've consolidated into other offices um, in order to make sure that we have the resources to deliver justice, not just at the charging stage, but all the way through. Um, and we have just recently published our core quality standards, which apply to our cases, no matter what the case is and no matter at what stage they are. And they're very clear and focused um, standards. They're very simple. There are four standards around victims, witnesses, <coughs> pre-trial preparation, preparation um, at trial and advocacy. And those standards not just apply to in-house advocates, but to external advocates as well. 
Um, we do find we have some difficulty possibly with court listings at times. Um, I was in one particular area this week where I discovered a new phrase which was um, rather shocked me because I thought it was a contradiction in terms, which was about priority listing for, uh, no, priority floaters for rape cases. How do you have a priority floater? Um, for those of you who don't understand that dialogue, it's, it's, about, it's about just a case which may or may not get to in the list. I mean, that causes difficulties for us, it causes difficulties for the defence, it causes difficulties for witnesses on all sides. Um, but I am certain that we are able to deal with our cases. What we have seen is that our performance has increased over the last four years in all of our highly weighted measures that we look at, despite our resource challenges. Um, so I am convinced that we can still rise to the challenge, not in every case across the way, because we have human error, we have all sorts of things that happen. You know, victims and witnesses may decide to change, the case decides to, um, the evidence will change. Um, so there are problems that we need to tackle, but if we are monitoring our performance, which we are, um, then I think we can make sure that the public should and does have confidence in us. Um, and we do achieve very good results, um, higher than the conviction rate that most of you um, asked for. So I think we do get very good results. It's sometimes around the confidence, because of course what tends to happen is people focus on all the negative bits um, rather than the positives. <laughs> Um, trafficked children, um, our guidance has um, recently changed. We've um, consulted on our trafficking guidance to, to say to prosecutors, you really need to be aware of some of the things that you should be looking at. So um, cannabis factories, when you, um, which you mentioned, is one of the things that we've highlighted to really look at the age of the person who is referred um, for possible um, charging and the circumstances and to ask the questions because sometimes it's about asking those questions in order to get the answer that then will illustrate their victims rather than offenders. Um, we have a national referral mechanism, which is where we refer people that we think might be trafficked rather than offenders in order for them to do all the inquiries and to find out, because obviously we can't do that as prosecutors, but they will. Um, it does cause us significant difficulties. We've had a case recently with two um, individuals who claimed um, to be um, youths um, and trafficked. When we investigated it, um, one of them was indeed uh, a young person. Um, the other one was 28 or something. So, um, and he obviously wasn't a youth and wouldn't have um, got any of the, um, um, uh, the guidance that we apply and the policies that apply in relation to young people. So it's not an easy thing sometimes to establish, um, but there are those mechanisms that we can use and ought to be using if we are at all concerned. Um, so that's how the guidance has changed. Does, I think that answers your question. Um, well, they're prosecuted. The, the fact that the guidance has changed doesn't um, alter their conviction. If they are concerned, if there are concerns that, in fact, they have been wrongly prosecuted, then, of course, they should be looking at um, taking the case back through the courts, through the appeal process, or if it has been to appeal, referring it back to the CCRC. Um, so that's how they, that's the mechanism for challenging that. Um, special measures, um, I absolutely agree really. Um, we are looking at um, making sure that prosecutors understand that they can ask the courts to look at special measures by oral application, which will be much quicker. Um, and in transforming summary justice, we're just about to train all of the prosecutors who appear at first instance to do exactly that. Where we need special measures, you do it by way of an oral application. You don't have to wait for a written application. I mean, there is something around when you look at it, um, pretty much, probably about 98%, if I'm just plucking a fig figure out the air, but around about 98% of those special measures that we ask for are granted. Um, which does rather raise the question about if it's granted in that respect, should we move to a system whereby they're automatic if, unless there is an objection or an exception, um, which might be a far more effective way of doing it. And certainly I think that's something that um, the President of the Queen's Bench Division, Brian Leveson, is looking at in his review of criminal justice, and certainly we've raised that. Um, contribution to um, third sector. Um, we've already heard some of the issues around our resource constraints. Um, financially, 
um, we can't um, do anything in relation to funding um, third sector organisations. Um, what we can do, of course, is support them in other ways, um, and we certainly talk to them a lot about how we might be able to um, work together um, and support them through either coming to talk at events that they might have or in other ways, but um, resource-wise, um, we can't, I'm afraid. Thank you so much. That's absolutely wonderful. That's really, really interesting. And, and your talk was interesting, but also I, I always like the questions best because it's so varied and you dealt with so many different issues. So I'm, I'm really very grateful indeed. Um, fascinating. Thank you. Um, now, I just actually talking about resources, this is my opportunity to give a plug to membership. If you are not already a paid-up member of the Howard League, you will not be allowed to leave the building. <laughs> My staff are well trained at rugby tackling you, so be warned. Um, we are an independent charity and, of course, a law firm, um, and uh, we, we rely on voluntary donations so, um, and membership, so, so do bear that in mind. Um, Thank you for coming. I do hope you know, you'll take the opportunity to um, have a drink and, and a little nibble and talk to each other. And uh, we'll see you again next year. Thank you.